Welcome to Tim's Vinyl Confessions, everyone. I'm Tim Durling, and it is my pleasure to welcome a very special guest to the show. Uh, if you're a fan of the show, chances are you've got this man's guitar playing and or songwriting somewhere in your music collection. Uh, we're here to talk about a couple of things in particular, but I want to welcome uh, one of Canada's most in-demand guitar shredders, Mr. Sean Kelly. Hello, sir. Hey, Tim. How are you? I'm doing great, man. I appreciate you coming on to do this. We um, was talking before we started, like we've been like ships in the night on the Contrarians because we both uh, appeared on there talking about, uh, you know, various albums. I've really enjoyed uh, your insights on um, Cinderella's Heartbreak Station and also uh, Skid Row Subhuman Race. Uh, oh, right on. Really, Thank you. Really made me rethink both of both of those albums in a different way. So I guess oh, that's the whole man. point of doing those episodes. So. Yeah, so Sean's a uh, busy guy, and, and and really glad to have him on here tonight, uh, today, whenever you're watching this. But first thing I want to talk about is a really cool book that Sean has put out with one of the best titles. Don't, don't you dare call it hair metal. <laughs> a big no-no. And uh, as soon as I knew that, um, you know, I, I was aware of this book's existence, knowing that Sean wrote it, what it's called, I kind of had a feeling what this was going to be about. And, and I was, you know, I was right. Art in the excess of 80s rock. And man, I feel so much connection with this because I think we're about the same age. I was born 74. I think you're 72. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we yeah. both, we both are 80s kids, man, <laughs> watching, you know, growing up, uh, watching much music and, uh, you know, uh, get the Canadian side of things. I'm, I'm back out East in the Maritimes, but, um, Okay. Same idea. We had the same programming and um, grew up loving a lot of the same music, it seems. Um, one thing <laughs> in particular, I, I, I noticed that uh, we both had a particular affinity for an album called Slippery When Wet. Oh, yeah. Which was a big game changing album for me. I mean, that's the album that got me reading liner notes and uh, seeing if a band had other albums before and having to go get those. And the, the, basically the whole disease started right there. And oddly enough, you mentioned this in the book. Um, the difference was that you were already playing guitar. I didn't start playing guitar until I was 18. It was way late. But when I did uh, start playing, the very first thing I learned was the intro to Wanted Dead or Alive. So, ah, right on. I think that's another generation stairway to heaven. I really do. As far oh, as yeah. songs, it's songs to learn that little, that little uh, intro on there. I can, I can do it in my sleep. I've done it so many times, but anyway, um, so this book basically talks about, you know, why this music matters. Um, but there's so much more to it. You go way back in time and talk about the roots of, you know, the, the problem with the term hair metal is that you say it, we all know what it, we're talking about, but it's by its very nature, it's a derogatory. It sounds, it sounds like a dismissive term and we don't want to talk about this music in dismissive terms, but it is a catch all, uh, blanket term for this form of music. But, uh, you go into so much depth about it, but first thing I want to, you know, I want to say that I think the book starts off beautifully with a wonderful dedication about your late dad's. That was that was a really really nice way to start things off, and and also um, in that you use a Mr. Big song, a current or you know a latter day Mr. Big song to just show how the words can touch you uh, at different times in your life, and this music really does mean something beyond just the, the the initial flash of, hey, that looks cool or that sounds cool. So um, when you started to write this book, Sean, what was your, did, did you have a like a plan, an outline? What, what was your goal with this book? Did you literally want people to stop saying air metal? You know what? Not really, because, the you know, obviously the term itself, I, I take no offense. I know what people are talking about. Uh, I've used it myself. Um, but... I did my my initial inspiration uh, was born out of frustration. It was born out of the frustration I feel from from artists I work with, from musicians I work with, from other fans who are very passionate about music in general. Uh, whenever I bring up something from this era of of uh, let's call it commercial eighties rock, early nineties commercial rock. Um, I find it often gets dismissed with a smirk. And and whereas if I was sharing an idea, for example, if I was in a studio session or a songwriting session, 
if I had derived inspiration for a certain lick or riff, say from Cinderella, from Heartbreak yeah. Station, then AI, yeah, yeah, it's kind of like a Cinderella vibe. That idea would have a much greater chance of not surfacing uh, had I, uh, than if I had said, hey, this is kind of an Aerosmith type vibe or a Led Zeppelin vibe. Just the name would bring about derision, you know, the mention, a mention of a name um, or, you know, the, the lumping in of King's X with Faster Pussycat or Poison with Bon Jovi, when really there's a world of difference between all of those bands and they kind of are coming from disparate influences or coming from disparate backgrounds. Um, but it did all kind of get lumped in because at the time uh, when that music was becoming successfully we also saw this uh the, the major conglomerates of the record companies starting to become more corporate and all of a sudden you had it was less about music people coming in and more about bean counters coming in people who were more concerned with widgets so they were just looking at data and saying well this seems to be what people like so let's just do more of this and let's use the elements that are involved in the success so all of a sudden you start hearing records by the same producers you start seeing videos with uh you know, artists wearing clothing made by the same designer. You start hearing the same session players being brought in to make records quicker because they had to keep pumping out product because they were trying to meet the demands of, uh, you know, their investors, <laughs> you know, now yeah. all of a sudden it's corp it's, it really was becoming corporate rock and a sameness did start to set in a little bit, even though I still like a lot of those corporate rock records um, there was a sameness and, 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 you know, the inevitable palate cleanse came in the nineties, like, and really, but that's just as much about a younger generation wanting their own music as it was about anything else. Right. Yeah. Uh, but the difference was the, because it was such an overtly visual era that when things changed over, it really did start to look like pant a pantomime of rock. When really I'd start off dangerous, when Motley Crue first came out, that was a big, bold statement against the skinny tie new wave stuff that was coming out. Like, you know, like it really was its own thing and it was dangerous. And and then that got co-opted. Right. So I, I see all the points why people, you know, wanted a palate cleanse. But what I don't understand is why we can't at this stage of the game in 2023, look at the artistic validity of a great deal of this music and why we feel the need to confine these artists to a picture caught in time. Mr. Big being a great example. Uh, I've often mentioned Mr. Big. Oh yeah. Right. They had that ballad. Well, yeah. they also had four of the greatest, most diverse musicians in the known universe and with a wide variety a wide musical background and continued to make music of uh, depth and passion. So that's why yeah. I wrote the book. I, but but I, I abandoned very early on this whole defensive approach. And really, I it became much more about tracing, uh, trying to humanize this music by tracing the, the sonic evolution of the music and also uh, the artistic intention of the artist and also how I changed as a listener as this music was changing, you know? And I think that that's relevant to everyone's experience. We all... As we, we we listen to music and, and we go through those formative years in our lives, we change and, and and the music we love changes and we have different experiences in relation to those changes. <laughs> yeah, there's so many things you brought up where it's just like, ah, oh, get out of my head. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it, you know, it's um, it's really hard to describe to someone who didn't live it. I mean, I went to, you know, I graduated from high school in 92 and I went to post-secondary. I took radio broadcasting for a couple of years at a community college. And I mean, that was such a time of change in music. And it was absolutely real. You were judged if you still carried a torch for the bands that, you know, you, you still liked and you still supported their new music. It, it really did seem like you weren't taken seriously. I was uh, told... And, I was if, told oh, by well, an he agent. Likes, this guy likes poison. What does he know about anything? Anything. Yeah. yeah. I was told by an agent. I remember when Skid Row Subhuman Race came out in 95. I was living in Vancouver and playing in 
uh, playing with uh, a guy named Dale Martindale, who is a singer, a new wave band called Images in Vogue. And we were kind of doing. Yeah, I was going to say, I thought I recognized that name. Yeah, yeah. We and and we, you know, we were making some waves and some strides there. And, and it, but it was really more reflective of what was happening in 1995, which was more of a it was still rock and roll, but it was a more of a alternative inflected rock and roll. And I was trying to find my footing with all of that. Right. It was a change in approach. And but um I remember my agent at the time, our agent said, don't ever tell anybody that you were going to buy that record. I was so excited it was coming out that day. And I told her, I said, oh, this is going to be amazing. Like, I can't, I can't wait to get this. Finally, new Skid Row. And she was like, oh, God, it's so lame. So stupid. I'm going, what? I, I, Because to me, they didn't strike me. They struck, they struck me as different than what was happening in commercial hard rock at the end of the, like, to me, they felt more street. That felt more generous. So, uh, genuine. I, I, I was surprised to see the derision that even bands like that had. And it just seemed you were going to get tarred with the same brush, no matter yeah. what you did. If you had long hair, you wore tight jeans, you, you know, uh, you, you, you played more than this many notes in a guitar solo. Uh, you had a Floyd Rose on your guitar, all this stuff, right? Like it was just going to be, wasn't going to work out for you and and i was like okay so this is really serious i gotta it was a, it was a yeah it, the 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 uh the bias was real like it, oh, yeah. it was it was absolutely it wasn't something you know and years later i used to think well maybe it wasn't as bad as i thought and then it was like no it was that bad in fact it was worse it was it, it was it was so oh, you had to choose and i never understood that well i remember going uh, I, I played on a record in the late nineties um, uh, on a, a, a band of a successful Canadian band's new record. I played on the record and then there was a touring opportunity to go out and play with them. The band will remain nameless, but I went and auditioned and they didn't like my, I, ha, I had a, a Eddie Van Halen Wolfgang and a 5150 amp and they took one look at my gear and they were like, no, I didn't even get like, I, I, there, that was it. I did not have the right, and I was like, oh, okay, so uh, that's when, I, you know, and I remember going out and getting a hollow body guitar and polyester shirt and cutting my hair to Bob and I'm going, who am I? But I got to figure this out, you know, because I, well, I was young, I was in my 20s, like I wanted to work, I wanted to, you know, and, and, and in a way, that was a good experience because it made me diversify, and I love a lot of the music from the 90s, like I, I, loved a lot of the stuff that was contemporary the stone temple pilots the alice in chains the i mother verse i i loved all that stuff and uh but i definitely had to you know think about it i i couldn't some of my natural instincts of what i would nor naturally do had to be tamed and i still find that to this day like yeah you know if one one thing can remind somebody of the 80s and all of a sudden it's like oh that's too many you know it's like that you don't do and i'm going it's just a, a mode of expression. Like, I mean, we mix things all the time. You mix the 60s and 70s. Why not mix the 80s and the 2000s? I don't know. Yeah, it was it was a really hard time. And, and you're right. You you did have to kind of be covert about it. Um, I had a discussion with a guy and we were talking about Winger and how great an album pulled is. Yeah. Well, man, that album couldn't have come out at a worse time. Spring of 93 didn't stand a chance. Never mind the Beavis and Butthead thing. I mean, that didn't help. But and I mean, Lars it just... Lars Allard's throwing a dart. Yeah. And Kip it was just face, dead in, like, yeah, yeah. It was just dead in the water. And it's too yeah. bad because I think that a lot of these bands were really hitting a stride and really putting out some of their best, their smartest work. I love Poison's Native Tongue. I love this, the, the Motley Crue, the self-titled album. Now, it doesn't oh, yeah. sound like Motley Crue, but it's a great album. Beautiful and record, and yeah. even even um, you know, and Skid Row's a great example. But even Motley Crue, when they came out with Primal Scream, I thought I like this direction. It's it's Motley Crue. You can tell it's Motley Crue, but they're just getting better. They're getting better at what they do, and it's it, you know, we'll never know what would have what might have happened. It it, but you know, there's so many things I'm conflicted about on it because you know, I'm not a grunge guy. I never, you know, I, I, I was so awkward and out of place <laughs> in those years, yeah. still valiantly hanging on to my Bon Jovi and Def Leppard and seeing what, you know, you know, what are they doing now? What, what does it matter if they've, you know, Oh, they've had so many albums. What the difference does it make? You all like Aerosmith. They've had way more albums than that. You know what I mean? Like, but if you were from the eighties, it was this, it, it was this black mark. 
Um, but oh, yeah. at the same time, I do understand why it had to happen. And like you said, there were just too many bands being signed. Um, I'm not going to say it was Atlantic Records' fault, but it seemed like an awful lot of in the next two years, like from 93, 94, 95, 96, a lot of cutouts were on Atlantic. It seemed like they signed way too many bands, all I, I competing don't... for the same space. Yeah. And all basically doing the same thing. And between 15 bands, and there's always going to be exceptions, maybe they had one truly great song. It was time for something different. Yeah, it it, it just became, uh, you know, they were trying, and, and they knew that they could hit with a power ballad, right? So if yeah. you had the power ballad, you could hit at, at, at CHR radio, and that would drive sales. And they were playing a numbers game, right? And and yeah, I think, I think it did suffer, like... Um, they were trying to get too much stuff out there too quickly. Yeah. And that's something else that I remember very much noticing is that the first thing that happened is that usually a band would come out. First thing would be like a rocker an anthem type of song. Then they'd follow it up with another, another one, maybe a little more mid tempo. Then the third single or fourth would be the ballad. Yeah. Well, after a while, the second single was the ballad. They went right to the ballad. And then the first and maybe only single was the ballad. Like they just, yeah. they were just path of least resistance, right? That's right. And it just, so, and then, so the result of all that is that you get to 2023, we're, we're talking about this, rock bands stopped having hit singles. Like rock bands stopped having legitimate crossover hit singles that everybody knows. I have to bring up Dee Snyder because you talk about Dee in the book. He had a great quote. I think this was in Metal Edge around 96. He was talking about the changeover. He said, the truth of the matter is, if one band is good, one band is good. But try telling that to a record label. Yeah. They think if one is good, 100 is better. Yeah. So, and and, and it's, it's true. You did have it. All of these artists were painted with the same brush. And it just became this negative connotation. And what really used to bug me, Sean, is you'd see interviews with I don't even know what bands. I would just be incensed reading Rolling Stone and Spin and and watching much music. And these guys would talk about, oh, well, yes, I grew up listening to uh, Velvet Underground and Sonic Youth. I'm like, no, you didn't. You were listening to Poison and Motley Crue and Twisted yeah. Sister. Don't lie. You, yeah. You've got a closet full of those cassettes. I'm certain of it. Now, maybe some of these guys did come to it, honestly. They really didn't like the 80s music. They were trying for something different. That could be too. But there, there was an awful lot of posturing that, oh, we're, we're, we're better than that. We're, we're above that. It's like, you're the next step. And guess what? A lot of these grunge bands ended up having some of their biggest hits with what? Ballads. So it was the yeah. same thing. It's the same thing with different hair. I think that... Well, a couple of things. I want to speak to your radio thing because I know there was a conscious corporate decision at US Radio, Rock Radio. Mark Slaughter mentioned it where they, they actually said, you know what? This format is done. We will never play these bands again. We are going full bore into this new sound coming from Seattle. And that's it. I don't care how good it sounds. I don't care what. And then that leaked down to MTV. So all of a sudden, a band like Warrant, who had a great record with Doggy Dog, it's just not happening anymore. And you got Don Einer at, at CBS Records. He's got the Warrant poster down, and now Allison Chains is up or whoever yeah. it is, and that's it. It is done. And it was, um, what do you call it in the ocean? Red Sea? When, when all of a sudden there's the, the ocean cleans itself and all the dead fish. Yeah. Up and that word really did happen, right? Oh, it was a bloodbath. Yeah, it was a bloodbath, and, and it was over – like that it was and eddie trunk talks about it too I, I recently saw a documentary where all of a sudden it's like hey all that stuff on your desk is off your desk here's your new playlist like get rid of all this you're playing this um and as for the, the the people denying their influence it's funny i did get an interesting perspective from some musicians guys i play with who were in the 80s but were not part of that scene who came from a, a legitimate alternative scene or a legitimate uh post-punk scene and it was like you don't understand what it was like for us if we didn't look that way so there was resentment building because they couldn't get work or gigs or you know it was the same thing for them they were on the receiving end so when it did come back around where the image was shunned they were more than happy to kick you know throw dirt on the graves of, yeah, of these I people who had kept them not working so it it, it, it was very interesting 
to get different perspectives and even the perspectives of people who are doing it. Like Rudy Sarso in the book kind of mentions, he goes, listen, I was in White Snake. I like what White Snake was before, you know, when White Snake was influenced by it sound like Deep Purple, like where yeah. it was coming from a bluesy thing. All of a sudden, what he, he said it best, he said it, it used to be about the cereal. Now it was about the cereal box. And so that's his perspective as a as a musician coming from the 70s. He's an older yeah. musician. You're like he was there from the birth of rock and roll. So we even talked about mental health. And he goes, that's a 70s record. That's made with a 70s aesthetic that just happened to be captured in a studio that had a certain sound that made the drum sound a certain way. And we happen to have the right song and the producer with the right vision of that song and the right singer. To, and, you know, boom. And all of a sudden something new comes out. But really from a 70s mindset, you know, interesting. That totally, Yeah, it totally makes sense. And And some of these, you know, some of the bands were bad it, and some of the bands were better at it and some of them weren't. Um, and there were bands that weren't very good. The cream rises to the top, but to paint them all with the same brush isn't fair because, like you said, they are all different. Bon Jovi yeah. and Def Leppard are two very different animals. I mean, yeah. they were like, you know, neck and neck for my favorite band in the late 80s, but they didn't sound the same. You know, they, they had a no. totally different approach to what they did. They appealed to a lot of the same people. You know, they had that, they cast that wide net where they were reaching out to more than just the hard rock audience, but they don't sound anything alike but yet when you had the flip over the changeover you know the light switch went off is all the same it's all garbage it's all crap and very few came out of it unscathed like most bands you know they 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 lost the major label deals they're down to cmc still putting yeah. out some good music you know i think i think warren put out a great record with not just doggy dog but ultraphobic ultraphobic but was good yeah belly to nobody belly was gonna hear song. it Nobody yeah. was going to hear. And then they would start going grunge. Then they would start to add these elements. And I never understood that because I thought I would always think, you know, I don't know who you're playing for because fans of your music like your music because of what you do. Um, there's nothing wrong with making changes. Like Dog Eat Dog was a different album than the two that preceded it, but still mm -hmm. sounded like Warren. But you do an album that's overtly grunge. Um, and it doesn't matter how grunge it is. No grunge fan is ever going to buy an album with Warrant on the on the CD or Dokken, you know, it, it just was never going to happen. So, you know, in some ways, I think bands like Cinderella and Poison did the right thing. They just sat out the rest of the 90s and, and kind of waited for it to come back. But you know what? The only thing I would say is from a consumer point of view, I get that. Like as somebody who appreciates and loves what was happening there, but from an artistic standpoint, Many artists, like, I mean, you're allowed to contemporize, right? You grow yeah. and you listen and, you, and you're influenced by what's directly happening. That That's where a lot of artists get frustrated, where it's like, hey, I, I like what's happening. I'd like to use elements of that. Like, I legitimately am trying to grow and stay contemporary. So, like, these people, these artists were still very young to be put on the, like, you know, to be told, you can't grow anymore. Like, you have to... Yeah stay doing this now some people like an acdc it doesn't matter acdc we do this poison does this you know cinderella to a degree does this but even they kind of grew even though th their growth was more about embracing the roots of americana yeah you know uh but but in order but really in terms of moving forward that's why i kind of really respected what uh tammy down did with fast but guy because he did legit come from industrial he liked industrial music like he, he said you know what i don't give a shit i don't care if it's popular i'm doing this because i like it and it doesn't matter anyway you know yeah and he went out and did his thing because he liked it and you know maybe calling it faster pussycat maybe he shouldn't have done that but it was his thing and he's his point of view was I'm an artist and I'm going to go and I'll take my lumps. The only problem is, is that you do, you know, if you do make that choice, then you do have to actually accept that you're going to get some lumps. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you're right. I mean, a lot of these guys were barely in their thirties when all of a sudden their careers were over and not just, not just the bands, the road crews, their you know their warehouse where they keep their stuff what are they going to do with that like it was really weird like cinderella is a band that almost should have been able to ride that out you know that the same people that bought that first black crows record should have been into cinderella especially heartbreak station and, and still climbing but all it takes is for one person to say yeah you do realize that they hold up night songs which that's a record yeah. cover that should have nothing to do 
with the music. It did become a visual, a visual thing. Yeah. And the only other musical movement that I can think of that had such a backlash against it is maybe the whole disco sucks thing in the late seventies. But yeah, um, everybody loves disco today. Like it doesn't have that. And and there is a certain there are a lot of people now that it just doesn't matter. They like that old you know the the eighties stuff, but there is still that element. And 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 I'm surprised when I come across it that uh, that in this day and age, you know, someone someone messaged me once. I barely knew this guy, and I, I won't say his name because it might not have been meant in the spirit it was. But I took it I kind of took it the wrong way because he said, "Man, your Instagram feed you post an awful lot of butt rock." Yeah. Butt rock, yeah. Yeah, you think now hair I would rather have hair metal than butt rock. That's yeah, just, yeah, same and, I, and, and I'm just like, um, hi, I barely know you. Like what what yeah. do you what do you do we still do that in 2023? Are we still not over that? Yes, I like this stuff. I grew up on it. I heard yeah. it said once that the music that you like when you're 14 years old will form the basis for the music you'll always love and yeah. boy for, for me is that ever true because i was 14 in 1988 and the bands that i loved in 1988 i'm still listening to them now i like i i, I like a lot of more more 70s stuff now too but yeah. man bon jovi europe white snake that's still very very near and dear to me yeah. van halen that that was another thing i liked about your book is like finally a guy that sings the praises of, of sammy hagar's era of van halen instead of just dismissing it good I yeah, that. that was my van halen that was me the too me too I, I, yeah. I grew up with I, and seeing that 5150 tour was like you know uh life-changing and and i loved of course i went back and of course i i, I mean i recognize it as a completely different thing and and you know in retrospect i can't deny the historical importance of the David Ross stuff. I love it. Like, I mean, I absolutely love it, but I don't, it doesn't change the way I love the Sammy Hager era. You know what I mean? And, and that, and really, I mean, Van Halen would not, I don't think Van Halen would have survived without making that change. Like Sammy Hager did allow that band to have a life beyond what David Lee Roth would have become. I do believe they, they were still having, you know, they still had a double platinum or triple platinum album in 1995 when most of their peers. Yeah. Had, but yeah, number, I mean, a billboard number one record. But end yeah. of story. No. Yeah. 86 was a big year for me, man. But I remember, like, I knew who Van Halen was. I mean, you couldn't escape yeah. the 1984 videos. Right? I, I, See, my I, kind I, of album. I didn't have any older brothers. I didn't have any, like, you know, older relatives to kind of school me on rock. I picked everything up on my own, kind of. But I remember hearing Why Can't This Be Love come on the radio and thinking, who is this? Yeah. This this I don't know who this singer is, but he could sing the telephone book and I'd like it. Like, this yeah. is awesome. And they said, oh, it's the latest one from Van Halen. I'm like, oh, that's Van Halen. That was my Van Halen. Yes, I went back and, and bought all the Dave stuff. Of course I did. I always did that. And yeah. really, in a lot of ways, they were two completely different bands, but they're two good bands, you know? Oh, but, absolutely. absolutely. But that was my era. Um. I want to get back into the book, Sean? Uh, although everything we everything we're talking about, guys, it's all in here. But I love how you went back and traced the roots of this music um, back to the seventies. How important was it that you? Because you make some really good points of of bands like Scorpions and and uh, like that. How you know they they really s sowed a lot of seeds, like. What was your approach to doing that? You kind of do it in two year increments, which is kind of neat. Is that just because there were so many bands you wanted to talk about and you didn't want to miss anybody? Yeah. Well, you know what? I I I think I just did it to make it digestible, right? Two and two years always felt like a good like a good evolutionary strand. It seemed like things would start to that there was enough time for what came before to settle, and then also someone else to come along and push the envelope. So uh, that's why I did it. And and as far as as why I went back. I think part of it was to say, listen, you know, if you love ACDC and you love Led Zeppelin and you love Aerosmith, like, let me at least say, if you hate this stuff, let me at least make a point that show you some kind of the evolutionary chain here and where, how it changed and, and, and at least show you like, at least uh, show you if, if you didn't like the sounds, here's why the sounds change. And that's why I talked to guys like Mike Fraser and, and Frank Reiner, like, you know, who, who were kind of explaining technically what was happening here. And, and, and really like good sound, bad sound, that stuff is subjective and it has to be looked at in terms of the technological things that were happening. And 
that's the thing. Someone can say, oh, God, I hate those 80s drums. But to me, those are the drums I heard when I was forming my love of music. So I love those sounds. And they're exciting to me. Just yeah. like you can say, hey, I love organic sounding drums. That's cool. I do, too. I don't hate an old Aerosmith record because I like a new Aerosmith record. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, yeah. Like, I mean, yeah, to be honest, I'll probably throw on dudes look like a lady before I'll throw on SOS or something. Maybe, you know, because that's maybe just resonates with me, even though that it's funny. The Aerosmith thing, I actually, that was a band. I did go back. And go, oh my God. These seventies Aerosmith records are incredible. You know, you yeah. listen to rock. Okay. And it's like perfect. I had, that, funny. I had that old greatest hits, like right turn of the nineties. That was like, yeah. this is amazing. Where, why haven't I heard this stuff before? <laughs> yeah, it was the Aerosmith thing. Funny because I, I talked about this in the book really as much as I love eighties guitar playing and, and a lot of people say, oh yeah, you, you're, you, you like you like all that eight stuff. I'm not much of a shredder. Like I technically I'm not that great, but my fingers tend to do more of a seventies thing. And I tend to get gigs with people who kind of appreciate that side of what I do. I I, I wish I wish I could play like King Bay Malmsteen. I wish I could play like Red Beach, but I I really can't. Uh, and I kind of talk about that in the book when when Guns and Roses came along. I was like, oh man, my fingers like doing this. Like I, I I tend to and I tend to feel music like that. So as much as I love the '80s stuff, I I really kind of love players like Richie Sambora. Like I mean Richie. Yeah, come, comes out of seventies classic rock, right? Like yeah. he's he's coming out of Frampton and and you know and, and Johnny Winter and stuff like that. Uh, but but he but he also had a bit of an eighties approach, and I love that. That's really my my sweet spot. Guys like Bruce Kulick and, and Sam Bora, John Norum, um, guys who have uh, Vivian Campbell who have a seventies approach, but also kind of had the energy of the post Eddie Van Halen, Randy Rhodes thing, you know, I, I, that's, that's really more my style. After that, my fingers say, no, thank you. You, you, you you've hit, you've hit your speed limit. <laughs> it's funny that, you know, um, talking about the, that, you know, Richie Sambor in that period, when you talk about um, production sounds like to me, my, uh, my favorite, and it's not the only thing I like, but my favorite type of production, I love that Bruce Fairburn, Bob Rock, Yeah, you know, Slippery When Wet, The Big Prize, you know, yeah. Dr. Feelgood, The Black Album, The Big Cavernous Lover Drum. Boy. Yeah. Love, yeah. And Loverboy started. Black and Blue, movie. that Black and Blue record yeah. that they did. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I love that sound. And I yeah. always, you know, I would love, you know, so if I ever had a, an album, I kind of want it to sound like that. That doesn't mean it's the only good sound there is. I like the way Aerosmith Rock sounds too. I like the way Aerosmith Night in the Rut sounds. I think that's an incredibly produced album. Yeah, um, for sure. But uh, I don't have a problem with that that eighty sound. I grew up with it. Yeah, some of it sounds dated, but some of it's like dated in a fun way. But it, it, someone, I don't know if it was, I don't know if it was Mike Fraser or not, but someone raised a really interesting point in your book about how it was an attempt to replicate what a band sounds like in concert to yeah. replicate that excitement and that and i read that i said yeah that kind of makes sense because you know the famous story you listen to those first three kiss records yeah there's great songs on them but the definitive versions are kiss alive yeah because you know it's the excitement it's the excitement of a you know even if it is re-recorded it's the excitement of a live concert and um and i think that's what people were doing now when you go back and you listen to albums that were done by programmed drums and not very well programmed drums. I'm not talking about Mutt Lang, who's you know the genius when it comes to that. I'm talking about ones that are there's no fills. There's there's just one fill every time there's a drum fill. Those maybe. don't age maybe so well. But but even then, if the songs are good, if the songs are good, I can listen through bad production. Yeah, for sure, absolutely. I mean, and and you know. It, like I said, I, I do think so much of that stuff subjective, you know, like what, what's good and what's bad. And, and at the end of the day, you're absolutely right. I mean, let's face it. Listen to, I don't know, Mamas and the Papas or listen to one of those recordings. Like, I mean, geez, some of those recordings sound like garbage to me, but the songs are undeniable. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, it, it, it really just depends on your taste, right? Like what what do you, what 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 was important to you when you were first getting into music and what's your reference what what do you value so and i think that that going back to the original point what do you value i think by going back and tracing a lineage i was like saying if you value these things in some of these artists 
you might find it in some of this music that you didn't know about because you only know the ballad or you know the, the single you know so yeah. it might be worth exploring so and I and that one picture of the the band that you're that you think of when you hear the name cinderella yeah. will pick on them again you got to look past that a picture yeah. doesn't play the music um, no you know another thing you brought up that was really interesting and it has there are instances where it's crossed my mind are lyrics how yeah. there are some songs that remember loving and then you go and listen to it and go well what how, what is that what does that actually say and then you're reading oh man that's awful yeah man i, I can't i can't get behind that i still like it, the song <laughs> those lyrics at the time i think you know i remember feeling oh they're saying that stuff i don't agree with it but it's edgy this is about free speech this is about you know pushing the limits this is about knowing telling you no one telling you you can't express yourself a certain way. And I remember being in that mindset where I was very much like, yeah, this is cool. But there's a cost to that. And, and the cost was that it was incredibly one-sided, incredibly sexist, and incredibly yeah. harmful and difficult for a, a, a great segment of our population, you know, to deal yeah. with. Because it was perpetuating stereotypes and this. And that stereotype was being perpetuated in the lifestyle so yeah. that for many women, the only way in to the industry was to either become party to that or to be subjected to that kind of uh, mindset. So there was a harmful uh, effect with all of those sexist lyrics. I do believe that. And I've worked with some amazing female artists who have told me that, who have been through that. You know, so I'm getting that firsthand. And, you know, even like, you know, I talk to Leanne in the book, you know, and, and certainly I've talked to her as we've worked together. And, you know, how strong you had to be to push through that and just even fight the bias. Well, you can't possibly write your own songs. You're a chick. What, yeah. What, the, what are you talking about? Yeah. I write and produce my own song, you know, like, but, you know, so I, when I do look at that, I think that that is the Achilles heel, the critical Achilles heel of a lot of that music was that they were, uh, you know, writing, you know, that that was considered edgy and rock and roll and dangerous, but those lyrics did not date very well. And certainly from a 20, looking at them through a 2023 prism, they they sound ridiculous. And, and then, of course, as it became more refined and more... Uh, co-opted by conglomerates it really did get very dr seuss you know like it really was lowest common denominator type yeah. stuff and 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 some of it is embarrassing some of it's not some of it's dangerous like i mean when i go back and listen to too fast for love or or shout at the devil there's some lyrics I, I i certainly wouldn't agree with from a sociological point of view but I still go on, oh, but you know what? That guy, that guy was pushing the envelope and it does sound dangerous. And there's at least some semblance of art or artistic intention there. You know what I mean? I, I felt like that was a guy who was pushing the envelope for art's sake, as opposed it's to sort of like a dark poetry, whereas whereas yeah. it, it did it, it did end up getting really, really like not even trying to be metaphorical, just being well, that's really, it. just just rude. I want to put my log in your fireplace. Like, I mean, come on, oh, yeah. man. Like that, like, that like, will forever. Be, yeah, it's you right. Know. You're right. It kills heels a good way of putting it. It's always the, but you know what? I bet you, you can go through just about any band's catalog and you can single out a lyric where they go. Yeah. I'd, I'd like to take that one. I could take that one back if I could. I'm not really, you know, proud of that, but um, you know, to, to use a kind of an abstract example, um, where you shouldn't judge something by, you know, something someone said at one particular time in their life. Um, you look at classic, any in classic movies, but even classic cartoons, let's say, let's say the classic Warner Brothers cartoons I'm a big fan of. There are a lot of those that came on the late 30s and early 40s that have not aged well for no. so many reasons. Yeah. But there's still so much else that was just wonderful and great and timeless. And I think music is sure. the same way. You can, you can, all, especially in this day and age where, you know, you get a, a site that picks up something and they'll just they'll just keep hammering on this one lyric. And even if the artist comes out and says, look, I'm sorry, they'll say, yeah, but you said this in, you know, 1979 or 1984 or something like that. But it did yeah. make me think about that because there were times along the way and I and, and I couldn't pinpoint it. But after a while, it's like you have to listen to something, you know, 
there's a, probably a really good reason not a lot of females like this band because they're not like they're not a likable band. You know, they're just they're just not, they don't seem like a, a nice bunch of guys. Um, yeah, and, I think and, you know. Then there's that always that thing about playing you know playing an album in a group of people and you're not noticing it because something's not affecting you, but there might be one person in that group that's get it gets real quiet. You know, that's yeah. like yeah, I don't appreciate that lyric. You know, I think I think. Uh, as an adult, what I've come to reconcile is like, you know, like there's it's it's OK to say, I love this Wasp album. I hate this lyric. Like, I don't this this lyric is offensive, but it, you don't have to, you know, like you can be judicious. It's something I try and tell my students. You can love a song. I mean, a lot of them like some some hip hop with some pretty aggressive lyrics. You know, I said you can like it. The music can make you feel good. A a negativity an expression of negative energy can be a positive thing too. Like, I mean, these things are good. This is what art should do. It should challenge you, but you have to reconcile that with being a good human being and being conscientious and not hurting other people. So in that, you know, I, I just think it, it, it's a type of thing where I always tell parents like when they're asking me, but what should listen? I said, listen with your kids and discuss your values, but don't tell them not to listen to something because I'm telling you right now, they're going to go listen to it with fervor. You know, yeah, but even but, even even more intently. <laughs> yeah, like, but 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 have the discussion and 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 talk about it. And I agree with you. I think they just canceling somebody because of something that was said or done that was in a totally different cultural context is makes no sense to me. We need to, and but but don't dismiss it. Learn from it. Challenge it. Call it out for what it is. Don't defend the indefensible. But say that, but 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 also look at it contextually. Like yeah. this is this is what we've lost in our world, in our algorithmic political world, where we are just constantly fed. Sorry, I'm going to get political now, uh, or at least <laughs> I'm going to get social political. We're, we we all just sit in our own information silos, where our own biases are constantly fed. We've lost the soft skills of being able to say this part of this is bad, but this part of this is good. We just create enemies and divide. And that's what's so sad about our world right now. We've become so divisive. Uh, uh, you know, we can't actually have the soft skills to see, hey, some of this is good and some of this is bad. <laughs> yeah. Not everything that came out in the grunge era was, was, you know, there there was many, you know, what starts out is that you have an originator. Yeah. You have a Nirvana. You have Soundgarden. You have Alice in Chains. Then you've got the watered down version. Then you've got yeah. the watered down version of that. It's it's cyclical, and I. But when you're in it, especially if you know if you're like me and you're in your late teens, it's every day you're living it. It's a little bit different than when you can look back on some with some perspective yeah. and begin to understand that. I understand music does this. It's peaks and valleys. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. But uh, there's a lot of value to be had, in and and you've like talk to a lot of people and a lot of those bands that you know are in my music collection and it's a great um it's just a great chronicle of it and i've never read anything that talks about this this music with this much um i mean you could back it up as a musician you can back it up and say no there's value here there's something here and I'm the sure other thing is. is that you take the the 80s bands and the 90s bands if you're to just put them in a room as just people Sooner or later, there, there's probably going to be some common ground, some bands they all love, you know. Absolutely, we're all music fans, right? It just it, it's a, a different approach. So, um, was there anything else that you wanted to, to say about 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 Don't Call it Hair Metal, Sean? Because it's it's a fantastic read. It's an easy well, read. I read it in no time at all. Thank you. Um, yeah, I I would say I would say pick it up and then and then follow me at at, at Sean Kelly Guitar and and come come and argue with me. <laughs> there you I go. Love yeah, it. And, I love and, it. And, and, and a, look, a good healthy argument is good. Also, I do want to mention that one of my uh I always love seeing old ads. Yeah, it was fun. But that, that's a that's a cool touch in the middle of it. So now we're gonna switch gears a little bit because one of the many artists that um Sean performs with uh it is actually one of my favorite sort of um unsung, I think, uh Canadian rock and roll bands. Yeah. Um I, I discovered these guys probably at 94 it was a little late to the party i'd heard of them but uh good old columbia house came through because they had the best of three compilation i picked that up and i thought this is incredible why weren't these guys huge of course i'm talking about coney hatch and uh the so sean originally uh the first thing i got that you were on was this little 
live at the Oma Combo thing. Ah, uh, right on. Yeah. Point number 76 of 300. Uh, this was actually recorded newer than what I'm about to talk about, but yeah. Um, this is postcard from Germany with uh, all the guys' signatures and, and uh, including Sean's. I think that's is that you there? That must be yours there, is it? Yeah, we. I, I think we did like a thousand of those or something. <laughs> so uh, I think and 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 every every big pile, someone would have it in a different spot. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So um, I remember thinking, wow, they they put out a live album. Now they're putting on another live album. Um, but I'm glad you did because for one thing, set lists are quite different. But the yeah. first thing I want to talk about is this actually has two brand new studio tracks on it, both of which yeah. are really good. Uh, it's about a girl and heavens on the other side. What can you tell me about um, the recording of those two songs before we get into the live stuff? Yeah, well, I mean, um, those, uh, the the bed tracks for those, I think the drum tracks were actually recorded during the sessions for Coney Hatch 4. Uh, you know, so they had had these songs that they had kind of started fleshing out or, or started laying down uh, and, and hadn't been completed. Um so when this idea of a live record coming out um, uh, was first brought to the forefront, they said, oh, well, you know, we got these two songs, maybe two new studio tracks. And I got to say, I was in there like a dirty shirt pushing Kerr. And I was like, yeah, man, let's do it. Let's get in the studio. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. So I was, really, I was, I, I, I don't want to say I was an instigator, but I was definitely pushing the buttons. I think Andy will back that up. I wanted to get in there and, uh, and, and I think it just worked with what Carl and Andy and Dave wanted to do. So we went in the studio and um, basically, you know, they had demos of those. And, and it was my first time being in the studio with those guys. And it was an incredible experience. And um, yeah, it got me very excited for the possibilities of what could happen in the future. Uh, I absolutely loved working with them. It was great to hear them talk about things like that Max Norman would do as a producer. And, oh, Max used to do this. And we double the guitars like this. I'll be like, wow. Like, it was it was a great learning experience for me. Great creative experience. And I'm very, very proud to be on those studio tracks. So it's, it's a thrill for me. I, I always loved live albums, as you know, from reading the book. So to have, you know something like that live recorded in Europe, like, you know, I, I, as a fan, I love looking at it. And then I get an extra thrill when I, I I'm in there, <laughs> you know? So yeah, that's, that, that has got to be such a surreal, uh, surreal thing. Um, yeah. Both good tracks. Um, I, um, I marvel to this day. How does Carl Dixon still sing so well when yeah. so many of his peers just don't have it anymore? That guy is, and considering, I mean, that guy's been through the ringer and back again. I, I remember seeing I, I the closest I've come to seeing Coney Hatch as of yet. I hope I can fix that. You guys got to come east. You guys got to come east to Canada. Um, but I uh, saw Carl doing one of his acoustic shows in 2005, and I couldn't believe how good he sang. He sang stuck a cappella and stuff like that. But then, of course, three years later, he had his car accident. Guy's lucky to be alive, but he's still got those pipes, man. Like it must be to be in the studio when he's laying down a vocal has got to be amazing. Oh yeah, he's 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 incredible, and I I've done lots of acoustic gigs with Carl too, and 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 just live like the you know he's he's a, a singer singer you know like I mean and uh, and yeah it, it it's pretty stunning like I've had the opportunity to work with some of the world's best singers I consider, and he's he's obviously one of those he's he's absolutely great and he kills it live every time Andy too I mean it's oh so yeah that's and that's yeah that's nothing you know that's nothing to take away from Andy because I love oh. what he does too I love the contrast yeah that's what the Coney people. Hatch thing is that contrast yeah. you know and it's, and it's it, it's so incredible so yeah so for those that haven't picked it up yet there's the the it's about a girl's a Carl tune heavens on the other side is an Andy tune it's got plenty of that Andy current attitude it's so cool yep. now um, there are some songs that are, that, that are in common with, with the Elma Combo thing. Uh, this was a little bit different. I mean, this was done in COVID times. This was an attempt to get out and play. But yeah. obviously, you guys had all, this has already had already been in the can, had already been recorded, because this was done in January of 2018. Yeah. Now, I, I got to say, from a fan's perspective, as someone who freaking loves the Friction album, you got yeah. Over half, you got five songs from Friction on here. When I saw the track listing for this, I was like, oh, this is incredible. Yet she's gone. This ain't love. Wrong side of town. Girl from last night's dream, which should have been a huge hit, and fantasy. Yeah. Like, um, 
great and a good mix of songs. I'm glad you did um, Blown Away in Boys Club because I love the four record. Uh, you just got me thinking what would be even better is a five record. <laughs> Coney Hatch five, including yours truly. I'm I'm all for more Coney Hatch music, but uh, but the band sounds great on here. Um, it's it's yeah. a really good mix of all the albums, but apparently Friction must have been a big record in, in Germany because I mean, it was. that's five out of the nine songs on here. Yeah, it was, it was a big record. And you know, it's funny. We just, we just got back from playing in Hamburg at the indoor summer festival and those friction songs just go over gangbusters. And uh, yeah. And, and, and that postcard from Germany set, uh, it was just one of those magic nights where the band was cooking the crowd was with us. Uh, you know, it's rough and ready, but but you can feel it in the grooves that it's, you know, we were having a good night, you know, and um, and I'm so I'm so thrilled with how it how it turned out. And uh, yeah, you know, Coney's got a lot of great songs. So uh, picking a set list can be tough, but it's cool to have the Elma Combo thing, you know, which to me was the Elma Combo thing was like 50 people. Right. Because was, that was all we were allowed to have the Elma Combo. So I, I'm really proud of it. It sounds really, really slick. We were, you know, well rehearsed sounds really you know, uh, re really kind of polished in a way, but that Germany show, you know, we were just, it was like throw and go rock and roll energy. So it, I, I think with those two live albums, you get kind of this, kind of the best of all the live world, you know, but I'm very, I'm very proud of the postcard from Germany record. Yeah. It's really, really good. Highly recommended. I have to say, um, I got this one from, I ordered this from Cleopatra Records. I'm always glad when it, when a CD comes in a good old-fashioned jewel case that stays together. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm old school in that way. Um, well, but yeah, I mean, you know, if, if you're a Coney Hatch fan, guys, you can't go wrong with this. Uh, it does have a great mix of songs. Um, yeah, that four record, I was so excited when when they came back with that. It had been such a long time, and, and reading Carl's book was, um, you know, really talked about how, you know, Andy said, "Hey, man, we we got more rocking to do. You gotta, you gotta yeah. come back." And uh, man, what a what a what a survival story with mm -hmm. Carl. But um, but yeah, I mean, you know, so I mean, the band sounds it's it's not like you're. Uh, I mean, you fit right in with with you know you're replicating the solos the way Shalski played them. I mean, it's not it, it's 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 just good. It's a good uh, the and and you guys lock in. Um, you know, Fallen Angels always fun when you go into the radar love bit. I always wait for that. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, I, and I know, I know, um, I know Andy's a big gold nearing fan. I had the pleasure of having Andy on my show too. It was, it was super cool to, to, nice. to come on as well. But, um, so yeah. Um, is, is, do you think that there is a possibility we might see a, a, a fully fledged new Tony Hatch album or. There's you been talk. Know. There's been talk, and and uh, you know, and I don't. I hope I'm not speaking out of school here, but it's cer certainly something I would like to work towards. I, I I would love to get in the studio and and have that experience again. And um, yeah, and I I think uh, the rock world would appreciate it. Those guys are still highly creative um, individuals, and and collectively, I think we we did a really good job in those two songs. I'm very proud of them. So I'd love to see more of it. If I had my druthers, I'd say, yeah, man, let's make it happen. But, you know, it's uh, it's not for me to say, not for the new kid to say, but uh, the new kid's certainly going to be dropping a hint once in a while. <laughs> right yeah. on, right on. That's what so, I do. I bug people till they do what I want. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> hey, man, uh, it, it's obviously worked because, I mean, you know, your resume speaks for itself. It's a who's who of, of Canadian rock. So uh, this is where I give you the floor. Uh, Sean, what have you got going on and, and where can people find you? Um, I know you're, you're on Instagram, you're on yeah. all the socials. So, so what, what's next for you? Have you got another book in mind or, or what's, yeah. what's happening? Well, it's funny. Um, you can, first of all, I'm at Sean Kelly guitar at all my social media. So just pop that in wherever you go hang out and chances are you'll find me there. Um, as terms of what's next, uh, as you know, I play with Lee Aaron and we're working on a new record right now, which is a uh, very cool surprise project, uh, passion project. We're having a blast with that. And uh, Lee Aaron is being inducted into Canada's walk of fame. And so we'll be there at Massey Hall uh, to support her and uh, she'll be performing uh, with Fifi Dobson, which is going to be fun. And uh, that's going to be great. Um, I'm also playing this weekend with Carol Pope. I, I, I played with Carol in Rough Trade for years. Um, 
so she she's playing up in North Bay in my hometown. So she invited me to come and, and join the band. So for that show, so I'll be I'll be up playing, which is great. Love Carol. Uh, I do have a new book uh, that I actually the the deal is just being signed. So ECW wants to do another book uh, that will be looking like it's looking like a 2025 release. Uh, we'll also be dealing with, uh, with, with, with hard rock, but this time from a guitar perspective. So talking about, uh, the guitars of hard rock. So, uh, I won't say too much. So I'm still forming it, but, uh, it's going to be a fun book. Um, and then I've got my own project, Crash Kelly, which I formed way back in the day. Uh, I've been recording some cover songs, some classic eighties cover songs as kind of a companion album for the book. My first book, Metal on Ice, we did a companion album. And I, 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 I like doing that. So that's another passion project I have. And yeah, other than that, just uh, looking forward to uh, some Coney Hatch gigs, more Lee Aaron gigs. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, I've, I've always got a couple of projects on the go. I'm also an elementary school music teacher, have a family. So it's busy times, but always just trying to be creative and uh, and take advantage of uh, all the, the, the great music I, I can. Awesome. Awesome. So folks, John Kelly, don't call it hair metal. Great read, great book. Um, it helps if you grew up in the 80s like we did, but even if you didn't, you can appreciate it for a good music read. And don't forget, go and pick yourself up. Coney Hatch, Postcard from Germany, a uh, new live album with two really good brand new studio songs kicking the whole thing off. Sean, I want to thank you for coming on and having this chat. It's been great. Um, we'll have to do it again. And um, yeah, like, you know, uh, just... Follow Sean wherever you wherever you guys are, and I uh, want to thank everyone for watching. And and Sean, thanks again for coming on. Thank you for having me, Tim. Love talking to you. All right, see everybody. This has been Tim's Vinyl Confessions. Thanks for watching.